Hey everybody, welcome to We've Got Ward, a daily plant productions podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss Ward while those return to the world of parahumans. My name is Matt Freeman and this is the guy who stupidly threw a battery at my head, Scott Daly. I I am I am so so sorry. No, it's all right. As you said, this is the podcast where you and I eagerly dive into Wild Bo's world of disturbing artwork, mother-daughter bonding, and alien-based death powers as we analyze and interpret this ongoing web serial. This week, we are covering chapters 7.3 and 7.4 in Arc 7 Torch. Um, as Ashley prepares to face the legal consequences for the murder of Bob, she invites the rest of the toys over to her apartment to help her move. And we cry. A lot. Then, Victoria, flying to Ashley's trial, stumbles upon a protest on the cusp of riot and stepping in to help out. Victoria has a chat with everyone's favorite dance mom, Carol. Uh, a couple of shorter chapters, Matt. Um, there's this big event going on right now. So these chapters um, were kind of just leading up to that, especially 7.4, which is leading up to this event, kind of setting everything to move into the eclipse arc. And uh, but but still, still some good stuff to talk about. Definitely, we, we've th- this arc torch so far has focused a lot on this ominousness of of what's going on with with the city. Uh, in these chapters, it, it things have degraded even further to the point of like open looting and just so much going wrong that she can't even react to it all. Um, this is a, a big a big step down in terms of what the city was trying to become, and Victoria is pretty down about it, obviously. Um. You know, at, at the same time, um, we, we have to mention that, that this is dovetailing with uh, something else that's happening structurally in the story. Yeah, and and us explaining how the hell we're going to cover this thing. Yeah. It's kind of unprecedented for us. Yeah. So, so <laughs> you, yeah. you go ahead, Scott. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, uh, right now, as we speak, there is a bonus arc going on called Eclipse. Um, it's chapters coming out every day and I think there are four of them out as we record, but by the time everyone's listening to this, I, I believe the fifth chapter will be out. Um, as you heard from our introduction though, we are not covering that this week because we've decided the way we're going to do this is this week we're going to do chapters 7.3 and 7.4 as usual. And then hopefully we don't know, but hopefully for for you know, for Wildbo's health, not even for our show, for <laughs> Wildbo's health. Hopefully, by this time next week, this special event is has completed, and then we will tackle it all in one big, longer than normal episode. So it'll kind of go back to our roots of covering a whole arc, and we'll handle this whole eclipse thing, this whole Boston Games section of the story all at once. And then I suspect we don't know, but I suspect the story will then move back into arc seven to conclude the the events of of victoria's story yeah we really don't know how that's going to be handled and i i think it's safe to say that a non-trivial component of our reasoning here is that we want to keep our episode titles somewhat meaningful yeah so <laughs> it's, it would be it'd be a disaster if we try to do like because there it would have been how, it would have been like two of these chapters and then two or three of the eclipse chapters and oh geez yeah that would but, arc seven part eclipse yeah right so it's all it's much better this way i hope everyone agrees yeah and i think it allows us to give these two chapters which i think are important and a lot of things happen uh they're due and then we also get to focus on eclipse i'm kind of looking forward to getting to focus on eclipse as one completed thing and we get to look at it as one done element of the story yeah me too um, so i think it's gonna be fun me too so sorry, no eclipse this week, but next week, super long episode. Awesome. So let's move on into the community spotlight where we read what people wrote from last week's thread. And first we'll discuss the discussion question, and which last week was, uh, what's the difference between acceptance and forgiveness? And uh, y'all did not disappoint. We got some very interesting answers. I, I was just curious because I- it was a genuine question for me. I wanted to... Yeah. I wanted to understand what people thought about this. So, yeah, let's get into it. Um, so, Hero of Old Iron said that the that acceptance is the act of understanding that things can't go back to the way they used to be and putting yourself in an emotional position where you're ready to learn from what happened, uh, be it about yourself, your friends, your family, 
or about people or society. Forgiveness is the statement and acknowledgement that you and the person who wronged you have learned everything you could and that this event should no longer have definitive power over your lives. Because of this, real acceptance becomes a necessary prerequisite for real forgiveness. Um, that makes a tremendous amount of sense to me. Yeah, I, I liked how they explained themselves. And I think that's one theme that we're going to see throughout this question is every single person who answered this question has their own definition and interpretation of this, but it is a well-reasoned, well-understood definition and interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, just to go, goes to show you like how personal these terms are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Tenki Forecast says, acceptance is meaning you acknowledge what happens, acknowledge the impacts, and try to move on. It differs for everyone depending on the magnitude of their trauma, but they think it is more about reaching a personal state of recovery. Forgiveness, on the other hand, implies wanting to repair a relationship with the person who wronged you. Sometimes this is possible, sometimes it's impossible, depending on the circumstances. And that to me is interesting because that has been, um, in my understanding, one of the serious pushbacks against the idea of Victoria forgiving Amy is this idea that forgiveness implies a certain amount of repairing the relationship and maybe normalizing the relationship. And a lot of people look at that and say, there's Victoria should never have a normal relationship with Amy ever again. And I understand and I get that. And if, if this is how you define accept it, er, uh, forgiveness, then I can understand really wanting to push back against that idea of for Victoria forgiving Amy because I think even even if they get to a place of forgiveness, I think having a normal relationship, have, uh, connecting back as sisters is probably something that's out of the question for them. Mm -hmm. and, and I've made the comment that forgiveness is something you do for yourself, not for the other party. And I think perhaps the pushback on that would be, well, no, Matt, you're talking about acceptance um, because if you accept what was done to you truly, then forgiveness on top of that is is excessive in some sense like it's not actually necessary to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish psychologically mm -hmm. i don't know I, I still don't know if i agree with that i think that forgiveness on top of acceptance has a healing power but um i i, I now am more open-minded about the difference between the two i guess yeah yeah stell hex made a table um where they start with different degrees of uh, negative sort of internalization and then and then how those transform into sort, sort of the recovered state and compare that with uh, what that means in terms of acceptance versus versus uh, forgiveness so for example we start with I blame you for this and we go to I don't blame you for this anymore and uh, with the comparison being a type of factual acceptance which generally requires a side of emotional acceptance or at least a different blame target um so basically that they're categorizing a series of um emotional stances and and how these concepts impinge on those yeah i think this was the most scientific answer um to break it down into a table and just look at the case study for each different type of kind of acceptance versus forgiveness. Um, it's a great way to lay it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Expert eye roller um, in attempt in attempting to define what forgiveness is. They offered up the example of Eva Kaur, a Holocaust survival kind of to define what, what forgiveness can be. And uh, this is a quote directly from them who says, as I've written before, I have forgiven the Nazis, not because they deserve it, but because I deserve to be free from that burden of pain they have imposed on me. Although I was liberated in 1945, it was I was not free until I forgave in 1950, 1995. What I like about forgiveness is I can still remember the past in clear detail, and I can even describe it, but it does not overwhelm me. And they all go on to say, once I get, forgive Hitler and Mengele and the others... And I can only forgive what they did to me, not in the name of anyone else. But once I do that, I am free from what happened to me. They no longer have any hold over my life. And this, to me, most closely mirrors what I view forgiveness as, as a tool to free yourself from the control of what the person did to you. Um, 
And so I like this answer a lot because it's kind of lies with my worldview. And, and I think actually when you look at forgiveness this way, I think the line between acceptance and forgiveness be, actually becomes very small and they almost start to mean just about the same thing. Yeah. I like this a lot too. Uh, and it seems to me more emotionally impactful to go all the way and say that you have forgiven even a a complete monster who sort of doesn't deserve it. um, Because otherwise you're holding this kernel of bitterness inside you, you know, but by restraining yourself from, from going all the way. So um, she makes more sense to me that that would be, you know, that, that, maybe maybe the actual answer is it's it's more like a continuum from acceptance to forgiveness and and the like the fully healed state in my mind is is when you've passed all the way through the continuum yeah I, that makes sense uh, dead and alive um first time they've answered one of these questions actually says that acceptance entails embracing bringing something toward you forgiveness entails releasing letting go of something you've held on to you accept people or events as they are, but forgive people specifically for being um, other than they should. And finally, while you can accept people and things for being nothing other than strange or unusual, you can only forgive someone for being wrong. And they, then they go on to discuss the idea of judgment as it relates to these two terms, noting um, that acceptance appears to be free of judgment, uh, while forgiveness requires judgment having been made. A judgment must be made to determine wrongdoing before forgiveness for that wrongdoing can be offered. And I think the most interesting part of this comment to me was how it differed from some of our other ones. Uh, While most other people said that acceptance was a step towards forgiveness, Dead and Alive argues that you can't truly accept someone until you've forgiven them, since we hold them to be morally wrong and not just different. So that actually kind of inverts the ordering of acceptance and forgiveness and, and distinguishes them a bit more such that they're not just really two points on a continuum. And I think that's definitely true in in the sense that we use acceptance to mean more, a wider variety of things than we use forgiveness to mean. Yeah, I think, I think that's absolutely true. I really liked that, uh, the part they opened with that, uh, acceptance entails embracing, bringing something towards you. Forgiveness entails releasing, letting go of something you've held onto. Um, there's something very good and and uh, that I like in that imagery specifically. Mm. Yeah, me too. Uh, great, great uh, answers, everybody. That was um, very stimulating. So yeah, it was a great, it was a great question. Thanks, Wildbo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> still, we stole that from Wildbo. Yeah. Who who'd have thought that he would have insight into how to digest these questions? Yeah. All right, moving on to general discussion of of the uh, of the thread in 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 the thread. Yeah, and uh, first we have with uh, the most fitting name ever, Tenki Forecast, who is actually a real life meteorologist, like in in the real world, uh, went ahead and expanded upon Matt's nerdy talk about what the weather around the portal would be like. Um, They indicated that that it would cause a a huge potential mix of high and low pressure systems that would not only be near impossible to predict because they could change almost instantaneously, but it would also result in some very serious weather events that could go down uh, that not only couldn't predict, but it could get real bad when you have these high and low pressure systems mixing through portals. Yeah. Well, I mean, my first thought was like, if you had one portal in like, you know, where you live and one portal where I live, then what would actually happen is the atmosphere of your planet would drain into my planet <laughs> and until, until like there was some equalization where, your entire world was a lower pressure and my entire world was a higher pressure because of the altitude God. difference. Yeah, that's true. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cal Subalu expands upon our Leo, Leo constellation idea a bit more. Um, I think that was actually Scott's Leo uh, idea, uh, pointing out that one of the Leo stars is Nemea, the lion that Heracles, AKA Hercules um, killed as one of his labors. Cal Subalu then reminds us why Heracles was on these labors in the first place. He killed his children and the children of his half-brother while under a madness inflicted by Hera, a powerful and estranged family member. He draws this connection back to Victoria, noting a few similarities between Vicky and the Herc. Interesting stuff. Yeah, I thought that was a cool comparison. He kind of says maybe maybe Victoria's cape name will have something to do with that that Heracles connection if it goes through Leo. Um 
just just interesting comparisons between the two of them. Mm hmm. Like the their strength, their invulnerability. Um, he went on and talked about how Hercules, after defeating the lion, like wears the lion's skin around himself, the, the invulnerable lion. Um, so he becomes invulnerable by this other thing he's wearing on top of him. Just little tiny little connections between these characters. Uh, maybe not even intentional stuff. Just, you know, Greek myths are very archetypal. So they tend to slot into other things mm-hmm. a lot. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Uh, I'll be paying attention for those connections from now on. I mean, the the yeah. lion is a very prominent motif in in Hercules stories. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And lastly, for the week, uh, Chronos six sixty nine, nice, uh, spent a little time contrasting between Yamada and Darnall, using their own experiences with both mental illness and therapy to kind of comment on these two different styles. They say um, that Yamada was what Victoria needed when she was the wretch, but but Darnall is exactly what she needs right now. Expanding upon this, Kronos says that Yamada's conversational style is a very common form of therapy and is particularly suited for allowing people in situations that are completely outside their control to vent and learn to cope with the things that have been done to them. However, the cognitive behavioral therapy as employed by Darnall is much more suited for those with long-term mental illness. This type of therapy is much more confrontational, making you realize that your brain is broken in some key ways and kind of confronting things that, that make you feel miserable or absolutely terrify you. They say this type of therapy is tough, but it is exactly what Victoria needs so she can stop coping and start recovering. And I thought that was just a really great comment, kind of exploring those two different uh, styles of therapy in, in a lot more detail than I could have provided because of my very limited exposure to therapy. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I have kind of like my own internal folk interpretation of the difference between coping and recovering. Um, but I would like to dig in more at some point into kind of what the difference is, especially as it's portrayed by actual, you know, actual therapists, because we both have this intuition that like she needs to move beyond employing coping strategies on a continuous basis to actually just not having the problems anymore, which I think is achievable in, in many cases for, for humans. Um, and we'll have to wait and see if it's achievable for her. Um, but yeah, I'd like to get a better understanding of whether I'm correct in saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you should, I, I just kind of piecemealed Kronos's comment together. It's sure. actually a very, very long post all about this so i recommend everyone checks that out if they want to get a little more because it seems like they have very personal experience with how cognitive behavioral therapy works in practice and the type of stuff it it can and does do for you so cool i mean it, i mean we said last week that there was a reason why yamada uh hooked her up with this guy like there was something that she felt he could do for her so um if if chronos's analysis is correct here it seems like that would be the road we're heading down with her. Yeah, yeah, I think so. All right, let's move on into chapter 7.3. And we open with the Misfit Toys driving together to Ashley's apartment to help her pack. Tristan drives and Chris mocks his incompetence as a driver. Yeah, I really enjoy this kind of fun, lighthearted opening to this chapter. Last chapter was pretty heavy with some really serious stuff, some serious emotional things happening in in that last chapter and to to both victoria and rain and there is there is some pretty emotional heavy stuff happening later in this chapter too but we still need to have a little bit of fun while we can and and this opening serves as that and i think it also kind of serves to re-clarify the state of the team when we saw them last week they had been apart for like a week they were getting together for the first time in a while and we were seeing all their physical changes in the way they dressed and looked and how those possibly reflected their changing states of mind. Um, so we're not exactly clear going into this chapter, the state of the team. What are they? What are they going to be now? And th- throughout these two chapters, we kind of get more clarification on that. I think Victoria is pretty adamant that they're not really a team anymore. They're just kind of hanging out and helping each other out through this transition period. Um, but I think it is important to look at this in the context of that, um, we see that them joking around, them giving each other hard times, them like being friendly serves that while they're maybe not a cape team anymore, this group has, has become to mean more to each other than just cape team and just group therapy 
uh, group, it, it, it's 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 expanded beyond that. They joke around with each other. They give each other hard times. They 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 actually joke around about their individual um, difficulties, their individual problems. Like this this joke that Sveta says, "I didn't get my license when I turned 16, but I don't have hands, feet, or a definitive birthday," which is a joke about one of the things that she's dealing with on a, a continuous basis. So I just I'd love how we're playing off and, and what it's showing the state of the team and the state of our characters. And it's just a great intro. Yeah. Like you said, I think these two chapters in particular are spotlighting that because this is one of the first times that we've had a, a character external um, to the team. And I'm not referring to this scene, but I'm referring to a later scene, a character external to the team say like, Hey, you guys actually work really well together. Um, yeah. So, so, so this, this whole, part of the story seems like it's focusing on how well they are getting along together and, and how much they do support and genuinely help each other. Yeah. Victoria too. Um, we, I think we at the beginning talked about Victoria's kind of being held outside the team. And then we, we talked a little bit about how that, that wall seemed to slowly kind of go down. But I think from, from that point on the, uh, the integration of her as a real member of this team happened like so gradually that we maybe didn't even notice it but she is fully integrated as part of this this group now um yeah funny you should mention that i was just uh listening to the audiobook some of the older chapters today and kind of, kind of got whiplash because i had forgotten how it used to be and and it was very kind of impressive to me how how gradually that change happened and how you know fully convincing and and immersive it was to be in her head throughout that and how natural it feels now yeah that's cool i'll have to go back i'm I'm behind on the audiobook so i'll have to go back and and check that out yeah i basically caught up today and and that was why i was like wow this is i forgot about all this stuff (laughs) (laughs) um so I, i like this moment here where Tristan admits that he keeps hitting the brakes because in one moment he says he thought he saw movement in the corner of his eye and on the one hand, I remember being a new driver and, and being very twitchy and flinchy and tapping the brakes too hard. But yeah. but also, I can't help but remember how, you know, Tristan, he he seems to, like, he seemed to get overwhelmed by the combat in the Fallen Battle, which is understandable for a human being. But the point is, I kind of read this as, like, Tristan has PTSD and just flinches at everything. And it it's to the extent that when he's in a, a high pressure situation, which driving is a high pressure situation when you're a new driver, he oh, yeah. he he starts reacting to things that aren't there basically, which to me suggests that he's a little bit messed up. I don't know, maybe over reading into this, um, but that's that's where my head went. No, I, that's that's kind of how I felt because I I think this works as kind of a tone shift in the chapter because we start out with this jokey lighthearted scene and our team is happy. They're playing off each other. They're joking around. Um, and then bam, we have this moment where Tristan sees something and, and kind of freaks out a little bit. And the rest of the team goes back to joking, uh, joking around a little bit after we have this, this adorable scene where Kenzie's trying to shut up Chris on the words of Tristan. But after this scene, uh, Victoria looks out the window and gets a little more introspective, almost as if the this tone shift has been picked up by Victoria as well. Yeah, right. And speaking of that, she looks out the window and you know she's reflecting on how something is simmering in the city, and she thinks there had been an implicit hope. I imagined that if we made those sacrifices and threw ourselves at the problem, we'd be rewarded with the city that had learned from the mistakes of the past. And then she thinks a bit further than than that line and then kind of concludes the thought with that hope had been leveled. And it's just such a, you know, harsh way of, of saying it that, that everyone yeah. leveled, you know, I, I just love how final that is. Yeah. And I think this, this makes explicit what you and I kind of inferred last week that it's not just the direct threat that the portals represent. It's not just the, the robot army or the um, Nilbog's army or uh, the other Earths and their armies coming through. It's it's the metaphorical meaning of them. It's it's that destruction of hope that she says that 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 return to the crisis point that they all thought they were going to get past. I love the line. The sky had been taken from us. Mm-hmm. So Victoria says. I mean, sky is representative of a lot of things in literature, hope, freedom, like the the wide openness of potential. 
And these things aren't just gone. They didn't just go away. They were taken. They were taken from us. And I love that word usage there. Yeah, I mean, it's she points this out more or less explicitly in, in various places, but it's got to be so demoralizing that you can't look, you can't hardly even be outside without noticing yeah. this giant piece of evidence that you're in, in terrible danger. Yep. It's inescapable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and like we were talking about before, I think structurally this comes after that Tristan, like kind of tone shifting moment where he had a little, a little mini freak out and I think that's that's great because Victoria is a very observant and introspective per- person. She catches things and she might not even like be fully consciously aware that she catches things. And and I think she sees Tristan's issue there and the kids go back to joking around. There's that, like we said, that adorable um, uh, Kenzie and Chris moment. The kids, they're joking around, but she kind of in this moment looks out the window and just starts thinking about the state of things. And it's almost as if like, Tristan's little moment brought reality back, broke this this um, magical sheen over everything that we they were one big happy family and everything was fine and good. And now we're kind of realizing that, no, the, the outside is is coming in. There's there's badness all around us. And it's a, it's a bummer. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right about that. Um. So yeah, as they drive, Sveta relays to Tristan that Moonsong has received a promotion and is now a more important member of the Shepherds. So we're kind of consider- continuing this kind of negative slide as um, Tristan's already stressed out and now Sveta is bringing some more bad news onto his plate. Yeah, and it serves as a, like a reminder of this ongoing Tristan-Moonsong conflict, which is, like, if we recall, this is like the way we were introduced to the character. Yeah. Like the, the first time we met Tristan, we were introduced to Tristan through this Moonsong conflict. And it, it's kind of went away for a little while because other things were going on, but this kind of serves as, as a, a flag that this is going to come back. Maybe not immediately, but sometime soon, this conflict has not over yet and it's going to rear its ugly head. And now that Moonsong has more power, more respect, um, it's going, the conflict is probably going to escalate. And I love that, like, the 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 escalation is not, like, this conflict is so wonderful because it's not explicit. Like, Moonsong being promoted by itself doesn't mean, oh, more conflict now. It's just in relation to the established relationship between Tristan and her. And I think that's a good way to construct conflict is that you've kind of built tension there without actually having to do much. It's just like, oh, yeah, Moonsong still exists and now they've gotten a promotion and we can fill in the rest of the the blank in that. Yeah, all we really need to know is that Tristan kind of heaves a sigh when he learns this, and he's worried about it, and that's enough yeah. to make us worried about it. And it sends him kind of down a rabbit hole of thinking about the before times. Yeah, and then he starts talking about it, and and we get several moments and, and bits of dialogue of him obliquely communicating more about himself, sort of. Not really, actually. I mean, he, he's completely vague and abstract. He's, he says, I dug a hole and kept digging. Something gave. I lost it. I became a villain and didn't even realize it. Okay, Tristan, but what did you do? Yeah, yeah, he's really, really vague. And, like, I understand the book is holding this back because we're not ready to really dive into Tristan's past yet, and that's fine. Um, but it did surprise me a little bit that Tristan would still kind of hold back from victoria and i think we just we just talked about how victoria was was fully integrated into the group and still people aren't being fully honest with each other and i was kind of was kind of ready to judge him for that and then i started thinking i was like wait a minute victoria is holding back all this stuff from all these other people like the only the only one who knows about the existence of the wretch is sveta she hasn't shared anything with any of these people so i don't think it's too outlandish to think that even even in a fully integrated group, there's still just some things that he's not capable of sharing or rather even just stuff he doesn't want to say out loud. Like, so if you're so embarrassed and ashamed of the person you were, like having to say those things out loud and acknowledge them is can be really hard. Yeah, certainly. And I, I didn't I didn't even mean to be holding it against him by saying that. I just thought it was. He, it's almost like he wants to talk about it, but he 
but like you said, it's too hard to actually say like, well, this is exactly what happened. So he yeah. speaks in abstractions and it's very natural. It's completely understandable. Um, sure. It's just, yeah. I also want to know what he did. So, I mean, we, we, we do have a lot of hints, actually. We have a lot of hints. I just want to know. Yeah. I mean, we know he's murdered someone or, or something close enough to murder that, you know, some, yeah. someone can accuse him of it and him not throw it back in their face. So, yeah, yeah sure. Sure. It's so we're. I mean, it's like I don't even know how to get the definitive story on what happened here, because even like Moonsong is going to have her perspective on it. He's going to have his own perspective on it, which to his credit seems to be one acknowledging that, hey, I didn't I wasn't the best. But um, I mean, maybe it's good. It's going to have to be Byron to mm. swoop in and kind of be like, <laughs> no, no, but no way, man. You, know, you don't trust that. I guy. would not trust anything that man says. Remember how you were so untrusting of Byron and then nothing happened for three arcs? <laughs> telling you, man, chocolate's going to come back. <laughs> You'll see. I'm sure. I'm sure you're right. All right. Um, so, yeah, he also mentions that he doesn't think Ashley is after redemption because they're talking about redemption. They say Rain is after redemption. He says he says Ashley's not after redemption. He kind of waggles his hand. He goes, eh, which is... You know, and, and I kind of agree with him. But then before he can continue, he gets cut off um, when somebody, some some mundane looters run across the road in front of the car. Yep. The unluckiest looters of all time. Yep. Yeah, the, this Ashley thing is a bit of a setup because I think I think we learn by the end of this chapter that that he is right, that what Ashley is looking for here is not redemption. The reason Ashley wants to go to prison and agrees that she should go away has nothing to do with redeeming it herself. It's it's almost just survival that that she thinks she thinks it's the best way to ensure her continued survival or her or to to save the destruction of self that she talks about. But we'll get into all that yeah. uh, in a bit. Yeah, and probably in our next episode. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that that's safe <laughs> to say. Um, yeah. So Victoria also helps stop the car by using her power, and then the misfit toys get out of the car. And they handily take down the looters. Yeah, the closest we have to an action scene in uh, Arc 7 Torch so far is this quick just taking down the looters. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there, there's a really small beat here, like you said, that she uses her power to help stop the car. So she activates her wretch in the, this moment inside the car to help slow it down. And I know it was probably like too quick. Like she just a quick activation and then shut down to even worry about um, it, like lashing out and hurting people. But I think it says something that she's in this really close quarters in the car. There's all these people she cares about right around her. And she felt comfortable enough to bring this thing out to stop the car. Mm -hmm. I think that says something. Um, I, I don't see Victoria doing that prior to the, the events at the Fallen Camp. Yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of different things that you could read into that. Like, does she does she trust that she knows what the wretch is going to do, or does she just trust her ability to, to control it adequately and, and kind of ex kind of anticipate its yeah its movements? Um, I think she's used it so much now that it, it may be just a matter of like, yeah, she knows that if she just kind of uses it for a second, it's going to be fine. Yeah, I mean, but I think that that shows a general comfort with its existence. Mm -hmm. Um, that that not only is she feeling like she has a handle on controlling it, she just seems more generally comfortable with it being there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, which is it, which is a change. Yeah. So before we moved on to all the juicy Ashley stuff, um, I wanted to focus on this one part that we see Victoria think about while they're stopping all these looters. Um, there's this one line where she says, "Will these unpowered people look back and think that they can't recognize who they were?" Or is it easier to justify and massage past events and past wrongs committed if you don't have powers to punctuate, exaggerate, and highlight it? Now, one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up, Matt, is because within the story, this part is italicized, um, indicating that this is Victoria kind of thinking these words. She's, she's literally thinking this. And then, and then you, you're forced to say, oh, wait a minute. This is a first-person story. Isn't everything we see Victoria do her thinking it? Um, why italics here? And I think it's because we're wanting to draw attention to this. This is not more than just like an idle thought. This is this is not just Victoria as first person narrator explaining the situation. This is an elevated and emphasized statement that she just happens to be making internally. 
And I think it's good that we draw attention to that because I think this is saying a lot of things in this moment too. Yeah, yeah. When, when you get into that a bit more, because this didn't really uh, grab my attention uh, so much, but I, I think it's interesting that you have you've drawn some things out of it here. Yeah, well, one of the things you mentioned last week uh, that I think in the back and forth energy of our conversation around that area that got a little lost was this idea that Victoria, in in her efforts to kind of dismiss her her therapist um, or, or, or test her therapist has kind of decided that parahuman problems are just way more serious and more important and harder than regular human problems. And by doing so, she might have like inadvertently just dismissed the difficulties and the troubles of everyday human people. Mm -hmm. And I think she's not exactly doing the exact same thing here, but she's doing kind of something similar because she even says throughout this whole thing that she understands why people would loot. She calls it cause and effect. She says she admits that looting is a symptom of deeper issues. Um, it's not usually an issue within itself, but, but a symptom. She recognizes all this, but she still feels the need to distinguish between the two types of people here. She says, is it easier to justify and massage past events and past wrongs committed if you don't have powers to punctuate, exaggerate, and highlight it? So basically, her argument is people with powers have a harder time justifying things they do because the powers that self lend um, to pointing those things out. And well, we know that's not true because <laughs> this is a girl named Taylor who had powers that was super good at, um, at justifying and massaging past events. Um, and, and I, I find all this very interesting because Victoria certainly cares about people like I don't I don't want to make this seem like I'm dismissing Victoria's concern and care for people. She very much does. A lot of her motivation throughout this entire book is helping out people, um, helping out innocent people that have been hurt. But it does seem like she's drawing lines between human and parahuman a lot and distinguishing between how one person can handle this difficulty and how another person can handle this difficulty. And, and the only reason I think this is important to bring up because I think there's this looming human parahuman conflict on the horizon. And I think when we have our main character as a person who seems to have a tendency of splitting the problems off and not totally dismissing, but uh, underrepresenting the problems of people that do not have powers that could lead to some issues as this conflict rises. Yeah, that's that's all really fascinating. I especially think your comparison to Taylor is is interesting here, and it, it highlights how different kinds of powers kind of do different things. Because the first thing my mind went to is like, well, what's the human analogy to um, to to a trauma that is centered on something like a power and like, well, well, I don't know, this, this may be a weird example, but like, what if you had a particular knife that was either used to hurt someone or, or that you like badly injured yourself with it. And then from, from now on, like you have a, you just have this bad association with this knife, but you have the caveat that like, you can't get rid of the knife. The knife is like always on you. And this knife now always <laughs> reminds you of this terrible thing that happened. Yeah. Um, that is, like I, I can see how like having the knife present all the time does sort of like punctuate, exaggerate, highlight those events. Um, and, and, and you could, you could get kind of messed up about the presence of the knife, you know, like that, that, that makes sense to me. Um, Taylor, like her whole thing was that she, by the, you know, by the midpoint of the story, she's like perceiving through and doing 90% of everything through the bugs and her power is such a natural extension of her that she like almost takes it for granted and, and doesn't even um, understand that it's as good as it is. Whereas Victoria is very alienated from her power, has a lot of a lot of problems with it, struggles with it. Uh, it's a big it's a big personal issue for her is just just the fact that she has it and that she can't control it that well. Taylor could control hers so perfectly that that was like you know the point of it practically. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because, and, and also Taylor never really othered humans. Like she, she sort of never put herself above humans uh, at any point. She had no problem kind of working with them and kind of wanting them to be her peers. Um, that was kind of a long yeah. tangent, but 
Uh, no, I like that. I think it's really interesting to to highlight like th- there may be reasons and they may be related to Victoria's power why she is this way uh, and, and why yeah. she uh, it, it, you know does this othering thing. I think you're absolutely right, and and the the the, the complicated thing for me with this is I kind of a- agree with her in that like the issues that people with powers have to face seem like so much more intense and so much more difficult but i think that the the problem with that is if you hold things out that way you're gonna piss off a lot of people that are struggling with their own problems and and they're gonna feel dismissed and i just feel like like we're we're ramping up to this conflict between between people with powers and people without and we have our main character who's saying my issues are are way way worse way more extreme kind of true but but they're still saying that and meanwhile you probably have people without powers that are saying um if i had what you had i could solve all my problems Mm -hmm. and that that essential kind of push and pull of that is going to i think be a big part of that ongoing conflict yeah I, i think that's very concisely summarizing it yeah all right um so, um, you know, she as she's rounding up the looters, she says, bad luck, guys. You pulled this just as my friends and I happened to pass by. Let's make this easy. Surrender. A woman hucked a brick-sized package of batteries at my head. My force field, force field caught it, knocking it aside. Heads turned to look at her. And, and then she says, oh, I am really, really sorry. Um, it's just funny. It's it's really funny. There's yeah. nothing else to say here. Yeah. It's funny. I love how it's paced because like the part that you didn't copy over is like she's saying like when this happens, there's one of two things people will do. They'll lash out attack again or they'll just realize they're screwed. And then we cut to her being like, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. I made a mistake. Yeah. It, it's funny that I find it somewhat easy to like get in that person's head and be like worth a shot. And then, you know doesn't work and you're like oh god it wasn't worth the shot this is a terrible mistake (laughs) oh that's great that's great and it's needed because we end this whole scene on a a rather sad note yeah um lucky that we happen to be passing by looks he said i smiled i didn't have the heart to tell her this kind of low-level descent was happening all over the megalopolis i could see it whenever i flew over when i told ashley that we intended to, to arrive at 2.30. I'd plotted for a detour like this because it was next to inevitable. It would get worse. The shock was wearing off. Yeah, so again, we're building this tension. We're creating these moments of seeming doom on the horizon that, yes, they, they relatively easily stopped this looting in progress, but this is one piece in a very, very, very large puzzle, and there's no way they're going to be able to stop it off stop it all mm-hmm. and this sentence it was getting worse it would get worse mm-hmm. the shock was wearing off it's just a perfect encapsulation of the the whole tone of post portal gimmel yeah yeah so as they reach ashley's apartment they're greeted by a patrol block guard this is at least the third offhand mention of someone explicitly connecting victoria to the community center incident and holding it against her yeah, and it makes me want to go back and read that whole incident and see how this could be construed as it's all your fault, Victoria, because she was just trying to help out. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I can think of is was she just supposed to let them take Fumehood and not do anything? I mean, it's true there would have been less damage if she'd done that. Yeah, I guess from the perspective of a patrol block guy who doesn't particularly like capes, she's just like, just take the evil cape. She it was fume hood was bad. Take her, and everything would have been fine. And also, so once again, these cape cape on cape fights are screwing everything up for the rest of us. Yeah, and I remember back then there was this mention that what happened to fume hood was like igniting this debate, um, over you know vigilantes and redemption and stuff. And you kind of have to assume that that debate was continuing to happen in you know Twitter or whatever, while the story has been going on and and who knows where the public's head is at with respect to that argument now. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, especially with these giant portals in the sky. Yeah. 
So yeah, we we uh, get a look at Ashley's apartment finally, and it's highly stylized decor. Um, I think this is a good time to go into detail talking about like the descriptive writing uh, that was used here, because it's it's pretty. Um, f- first of all, it's it's unusual for Wildbow to go into this much detail on like the description of a setting, but I think this is a great time for it because it's not just a setting; it's an expression of Ashley's personality. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's so it's so well timed because we were kind of mentally prepped for this. Like we we had whole conversations about how much Ashley cares about these things, the value she places in furniture and that kind of thing. And so we're mentally prepped for it. So it's kind of like we're being rewarded by seeing all this stuff. And you're absolutely right that it, this is not this is not typical wild bow scene setting. Um, I, I there's a lot of books that do it this way where you'll enter a new scene and there'll be like a page or two describing everything in the scene i'm thinking of george r, r. martin's um, <laughs> food descriptions where he just goes on for pages and pages and not, not to say that this goes on for too long i don't i don't think it does it's just a, a different kind of descriptive style than we've seen before and and like anything in wild Bo's writing like you said there is a definite need and function of it mm-hmm. yeah yeah i mean like just the different the different art um the the even the furniture is like selected with a very particular kind of style in mind you can imagine ashley kind of going through the thought process of how she picked it out or how she made it and and, yeah. and what she's trying to portray with it yeah and that that picture of the horse eating the dude yeah and um the coolest fucking bookcase ever where it goes from normal to on fire yeah what a cool idea. Yeah. I need some new bookcases. Maybe I'll make some some on fire bookcases. Yeah, yeah. That's uh I I had that same thought basically. I was like, that would be so cool. And and then my second thought was like, that would be a huge amount of work. I don't that think would I'm, be so much work. I don't think I'm actually gonna do that, but it'd be no. really cool. Yeah. Um there's one part of that I really like about this. Um they're talking about the artwork and Tristan like makes a um a comment about a certain piece of art and says, I wish I knew enough to understand what it meant. Um, and Ashley's response to this is if you have theories, keep them to yourself. I'd hate to have it ruined. And that's a fun little, I think jokey beat kind of, but I think it's, it it also kind of spoke to me because like the first thing I did as the stuff was being laid out was immediately start going, okay, what does this mean? How does this work? Um, what is it saying? What is it doing? What's the, what's the meaning of the artwork compared to how it reflects Ashley? And I think that's just like, that's just the kind of person art appreciator I am. But Ashley strikes me as the type of person who's just like, this fits my aesthetic and that's why I picked it. And if you tell me like the literal meaning of it, I won't like it as much. And it, it got, it sent me down this rabbit hole of, of thinking of people who all the different ways in way pe- in which people can appreciate art. Like there are people out there, Matt, believe it or not, that just want to read a book and just have fun with it and just like read the book and just say, I like that. And then just move on with their lives. <laughs> not if they, I have anything to say about it. <laughs> they don't spend, they don't spend upwards of 20 hours a week analyzing it and talking about it. And yeah, there's people like that. That's, um, that's weird. Obviously it's not, not us, but but it is a perfectly normal way to appreciate art. And I do think that the things that are in Ashley's apartment say something about her. And I think we're going to get to that a little bit later when we kind of crack the Ashley code a little bit as she um, reveals stuff to Victoria. But um, I do appreciate that there's like she doesn't need to know what the artist meant by that painting. She's happy with her own meaning and learning his would ruin it for her a little bit. Right. Yeah. I mean, it is, especially when it comes to decorating your own place, like a, a person like Ashley could legitimately have picked something just to be like, oh, people will be shocked by this without having any actual appreciation for it on her own. I'm not saying that's why she picked these pieces. I'm just saying mm-hmm. I'm just saying that, as you said, there is a broad range of possible uh, reasons why that is there. Yeah. Uh, so when they, yeah, when they get to the apartment, uh, Jester is there keeping Ashley company, by the way, it's now just Jesper, uh, <laughs> now just Jester, not, <laughs> not Jasper at, at any point. Um, Jesper. Jesper. <laughs> um, recall that he was also sitting with her 
after the fallen battle and keeping her company. Yeah. Um, for those of you that can't see our script, which is all of you, um, Matt put a giant fucking picture of a, a ship in the script here because he enjoys making me angry. Yeah. Um, Matt, I don't think this is a fucking ship <laughs> to say that Jester's into Ashley. That's just called a noting a thing that the book is clearly taking time to establish. Ip. Yes. Well, I I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> agree with you there. Um, I hate you. Yeah. So moving on from that delightful interlude. Um, <laughs> I've committed a cardinal sin, Ashley said. I asked you to help me move, and I don't have things packed. I put most of my books away and some of my clothes, but uh, so I, I snort laughed at this because she says she committed a cardinal sin and you assume like she's going to reference the cardinal sin that she committed um, <laughs> that put her in this position, but no. Yeah, but it is, Matt, it is a cardinal sin. Pu- public service announcement. If you ask people to help you move and they come over and you haven't packed anything yet, just go to jail. Yeah. Just go right to jail. Yeah. No, it's terrible. I'm just going to start throwing your stuff away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And not only that, but her hands aren't working. I mean, this isn't her fault actually. Like she can't, yeah. she can't back as her hands aren't I working. Know, this is like the one legitimate excuse. Yeah. Um, so, you know, her, her usual tinker, uh, is gone. So she, she's not going to be able to use her hands for a while, I guess. Yeah. And that's explicit confirmation that Bonesaw was portaled. Um, yeah. we, it was kind of suggested before, but yeah, by bones, huh? Yeah. Um, and I, I just love this whole character moment for all of the characters involved in it. So I'm just going to go through yeah. it. Are you okay? Sveta asked again. In the heat of everything last week, I said some harsh things. I feel guilty now that we're here. If I'd refused, or if I had tried to get away with it, you would have resented me for it. Most of you would have. You were right, Ashley said. Don't feel guilty. If you changed your mind, I'd have your back, Kenzie said. Chris <laughs> swatted her over the head. No, bad. Kenzie stuck her elbow out toward his middle, digging into the softer flesh. He grunted. I just... All these different characters get their little moment of how they are, and it just feels so lovely. It's so It's so good, and I feel like a broken record sometimes when we talk about yeah. this. <laughs> but I just, I just think it's because it, it's just where this book excels, and that you have these moments where the characters just ping off each other in these, these like they're so well characterized that Chris can say two words. No bad. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's Chris. That's just classic Chris. And it just, they're all pinging off each other and we all follow it and we can, it's just, it's so good. And I, I will not feel bad about us pulling these moments out when they happen, because I think it, it's, it's what makes us care about the characters are these little moments of seeing them just interact with each other like this. Yeah. Well said. And it's so particularly the the Kenzie Ashley stuff, right? Because the thing about the the Ashley's relationship with Kenzie and why I think it's it's so wonderful is that throughout all of it, Ashley never comes to Kenzie from a place of judgment, even when she was upset with her, even when she was mad at her for what she did with the cameras with Mama Mathers, mad at her for almost taking a life for the dumbest reason ever. Um, it was it was always anger out of concern, not real judgment. And I think we see that here in the, right after the part that you cut out. There's this moment where Kenzie says, if the tables were turned and I had to choose between going to jail or staying, getting in trouble and spending 10 percent of the time I do with you guys, I'd stay. Kenzie said, I know, Ashley said, that's who you are. And I look at Kenzie's statement and I'm like, danger, danger. <laughs> that's not good. Danger, Will Robinson. But Ashley response is just. I know. I understand that. That's that's the person you are. And I get that. I understand that it doesn't make it right. And it's not what I would want you to do. And I will be an example for you, hopefully, to show what the right thing to do in this situation is. But I understand you. And I love that so much because like you contrast that with how Houndstooth dealt with her, um, with how probably everyone in her life up until this point has dealt with her. And you see right there how important these two people are to each other yeah yeah no I, I agree that's another beautiful exchange um i'm i'm very curious to to find out more about why ashley has this has this particular soft spot for kinsey 
Oh, I wonder if there's some sort of time travel interlude. Yeah, I wonder if we might get some insight into that soon. Yeah. Who knows? I have I, I just want to say I have not read any of a clip, so I have I have no idea. Yeah. I I know the framing device of the 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 arc. That's it. Yeah. I, I have, but I'm not tipping my hand here. Um, so a- <laughs> Ashley provides them with uh, decadent supervillain snacks, which I just love. Yeah, they're nice fucking snacks, man. Yeah. Like It's like salted chocolate and more chocolate. Yeah. This is, I mean, it's, it's like sometimes you just kind of have to revel in the detail, right? Because Ashley says, well, as she's handing out these snacks, like, normally I only allow myself one treat per day. The same for any of my guests, but you should treat yourself. Today is a day to treat ourselves. And I think this does a couple things. It does a great job of illustrating um, that Ashley is aware of the significance of today and the significance of these people that she's having here. While also kind of showing us how like tightly regimented and controlled her, uh, her like daily life is. And I think when we learn a little bit more about how much of a constant struggle her life is, we we maybe grow to understand why she's so regimented with like, I can only have one treat per day. Mm -hmm. No more one treat. Yeah, that's great. I didn't, I didn't know. I mean, I did, I did notice the, the, I I only allow myself one treat per day thing, but I didn't actually think too much about it. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's one example of how she's controlled. Um, And then she mentions again that she has friends waiting for her in prison. And I'm sure not, I'm still not sure what exactly this is referring to. Yeah, what's your guess? Do you, I mean, is it? We know there's more. There's more of her clones out there. Are they in prison? Is she? Is she literally referring to herself, or some maybe some people that she ran into while she was still trying to figure herself out that were less than uh, upstanding members of society? Yeah, I think my first guess would be other other clones, but I don't. I don't even feel like she would necessarily consider them to be friends, um, like by default. Like, yeah. I, and we don't really know what she's been doing for the last two years. So it could be just be other people she met, like kind of in the, you know, not prison, but actually kind of prison system um, before she, before she, uh, you know, got in with his team. Yes. Uh, either way, I look forward to Orange is the New Black. Yeah. Ashley edition. Yes. Yes. White is the new white. <laughs> white is, white hair. Is, white is the new orange. Sweat swan song is the new damsel. <laughs> what? Yes. Um, um, there's, there's like a, another, a really quick, another quick, but a little bit unusual beat here where, uh, Victoria notices that as soon as Ashley kind of finds herself alone, disconnects from the party a little bit, like I think goes up and stands on the, the staircase, like overlooking the apartment, Chris kind of like beelines to her and they have a private conversation in between the two of them and, and victoria sees this and says that was interesting where there are commonalities in the physical breakdown she's just trying to figure out why these two people would be talking to each other and i don't think we've ever seen chris and ashley like interact one-on-one before am i off base there i, I nothing i can recall i mean not privately no that we've you know we've had yeah. dialogue exchange between them but but no not yeah th- this is a unique thing definitely yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's there, there's a lot of ways you can read this. I think the thing that seems the most obvious to me is both of these people seem extremely concerned about Kenzie. So maybe they're probably just talking about Kenzie. Um, but right around this time, Victoria notices that Kenzie is alone and then like pulls in Kenzie. Help me out. And she makes a, a packing game to keep Kenzie distracted. Um, maybe Chris is just kind of doing that for Ashley. She sees that he sees that she's alone and kind of has distanced herself and is recognizing that she needs someone around her. Mm-hmm. Um, probably just probably just talking about Kenzie, though. I mean, that's pretty much what Ashley does next with Victoria, right? M- right. More or less. I mean, so so next Ashley pulls Victoria aside into her room, one on one with her uh, to to help pack her clothes and and to talk. I mean, mainly to talk. I think. Um, yeah. And, and the first thing she says is, is she's she's checking in. She's like. Who are you keeping an eye on? You know, like let's let's shore up the the care network that we've established here. Yeah, and Victoria says everybody. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and I I really like that this is how the conversation starts because throughout this entire conversation, we're going to learn that Ashley is afraid. Mm-hmm. We're going to see everything she's worried about. Um, how how her existence is a constant struggle. How 
Um, she's trying to put up a good front about prison, but is actually terrified about what's going to happen there. But she opens this conversation by making sure that Victoria is on it with the rest of the group, make, making sure Victoria understands what she needs to do with the rest of the group. So out of all the things that Ashley is afraid of and afraid for, the first thing is what's going to happen with the rest of this group. What's going to happen to Kenzie. So she's, she's putting that as priority above all other things. And I think that says something about Ashley. Yeah. I mean, she has something that she actually cares about. Yeah. Um, and she, you know, she's reflecting on how it's already really hard for her to restrain her destructive impulses even now. Um, and that she anticipates that prison will test her even further. Yeah, she reveals that before everyone came, she almost destroyed her entire apartment. She almost killed the patrol block guy for just being annoying. And we kind of w w were witness to this as well. Like he gave her an order when she got too close to the window and her initial reaction was to tense up. We saw her eyes like go white as in she's channeling her power and she had to like consciously stop herself. And this is something that had been hinted at before, but is confirmed here every day. Every moment, Ashley is consciously holding back, consciously holding back this desire to use her power to to kill, to destroy. And she says every single moment she has to reach for a new reason to hold a new reason to hold herself back. And she says, I don't know what the reasons for holding myself back will be next time or if I'll look for reasons and find nothing. And that terrifies her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, like because in this moment she has her her you know genuinely beloved friends coming over to to check on her and and that must you know whatever else is going on with her she has she certainly has enough humanity left that 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 feels really good and, and is worth protecting but when she's yeah. in prison you know that that it's not going to be easy to reach for that anymore yeah and i think it's fun to go back to ashley's previous behavior now that we've learned so much about her and this whole thing got me thinking about the time when she was talking about being a hero and how she would say things like, I'm just going to try this for now. As soon as this thing fails, I'm going to go back to being a villain. That's what I'm supposed to be. And I think we see now that wanting to be the hero is something that she actually did want. It's not something she was just pretending. It's not something she was doing at temporary. She's constantly fighting against her very nature and she's so terrified of failing that she's almost like trying to psychologically build up failing as an inevitability so that it won't hit her as hard when it happens. Like, like it's so it's it's not as disappointing when it actually happens. It's like it's like, you know, when we you were a kid and you were like thought you were going to do really bad on a test and you were like, well, I'm going to bomb it anyway, so it doesn't matter. Like you don't want to fail the test. You're just telling yourself that it's definitely going to happen. So when it actually does, you're like, see, I knew that was going to happen. It doesn't doesn't sting as much because I figured that was going to happen. Um, it's just this interesting psychological ploy that makes so much more sense within Ashley now. Right. Yeah. It's interesting because in Glowworm, in the prologue, all we really saw of Ashley was that that uh, grandiose facade and, and, and supervillain posturing. And now we've seen there's like a real person in there um, that keeps kind of getting forced under the water by whatever else is going on with her. Um, and, and, and yeah, like you said, I think I think that 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 person in there wants to be a hero and wants to succeed at that. Um, but she's fighting an uphill battle. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so she, as they're as they're in her room, she tells Victoria to keep any of the clothes that she likes. Uh, of course, the clothes are all black and probably wouldn't fit Victoria, uh, but I still had emotions about it. Me too, Matt. Me too. Mm -hmm. And thank God Victoria has the presence of mind to just say thank you yeah. and not say, oh, those won't fit me. Yeah, right. <laughs> Good for you, Victoria. <laughs> Good move. Um, and then um, Ashley's asking for some things. She says that the two other things, hmm, I could offer it as a trade. A trade of what? I'm stealing Rain's thunder, but maybe a haircut? And then Victoria says, I'm working with one hand. I can use it. I can use the other some, but how much of a haircut? The haircut we thought would work for Swan Song, Ashley said. And then I'm crying. Yeah. I love this so much. I like 
there's so much of Ashley like that seems she's she seems like she's resigned to going to prison now. She's decided it's going to be the best thing for her. Um, it's it's going to be what she probably deserves. But I think the important thing here is she it's, she hasn't given up, right? Mm-hmm. Um, she's not ready to give up. She's not ready for her swan song, mm. and so to to almost seemingly to give herself a reminder of that, to to give herself a reason to keep looking for those um, those reasons to hold back. The haircut is a reminder. It's mm-hmm. like this is this is truly who you want to be. This connects you to the people that you care about, and that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like that last bit as a as a connection, as a reminder. Yeah, that that is yeah. that's beautiful. And then she asks Victoria to take over her rent of the apartment. She says, "I never had a place, Victoria. My life is vague dreams and clear destruction. Again and again, life tells me I can't do this, I can't do that. It goes wrong, or I can't think of it as being right. And I'm not talking about right as good. The thoughts loop through my head that nobody can be trusted. Everyone is out to get me, and." Dying is a really good reality check. I'm trying to take that to heart. I was trying. It's sad. Yeah. <laughs> and and she seems to want to believe that it might actually be easier for her in prison because she's yeah. someone else's concern, uh, but Victoria doesn't buy it. No. She And Victoria thinks she was trying to build a new self like someone built a house of cards. It was a precarious thing, and if she slipped up once, destruction of the self something completely different from death. If she had a last chance, then this would be it. Yeah. I, I love all this so much. It's, it's heartbreaking. It's beautiful. It's, it's saddening and awe inspiring at the same time. Ashley is trying so hard. And every time she, she's successful, every time she stops herself, her body, her, her life, her very existence is telling her, no, that's wrong. Mm-hmm. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's and and all of a sudden, I think it makes sense why Ashley acts the way she does, why she decorates the room, her room the way she does, why she does all these things, these this grandiose villainy, these constant threats of violence, these violent pictures all over her house. She's trying to appease her inner self. She's trying to almost trick her shard accept this if if this is enough for you hopefully this will be enough to to make it so you don't constantly want to make me take that next step go that extra distance to go too far and that's so fucking sad yeah just the the wording of it goes wrong or i can't think of it as being right i'm not talking about right as good She, she even when things are going swimmingly for her and and people are taking care of her that thing is still telling her no 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 you, you this isn't this isn't right you can't trust right. these people you uh you, you need to get out of the situation you need to run away you need to, you need to lash out and yeah. and it's it's got to be miserable yeah i just i'm imagining this person trapped in this thing that feels like i have to i have to posture violently i have to lose my cool every so often because the alternative is disintegrating people yeah and i don't want to be this way i don't want to do these things but i don't have a choice Mm -hmm. and i look at this and i I think we're going to learn so much more about her in the eclipse arc i I absolutely think that's going to be one of the big objectives of that story Mm -hmm. but right now i'm looking at this character i've grown to love so much and i can't see a happy ending for her. I can't see a place where she gets out of this thing. Okay. Because as Victoria says at the, at the end of this chapter, her it's her life is a long, long walk on a razor's edge and she's terrified and I'm terrified for her. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I, I agree. Like in this moment, you're like, I don't see, I don't see a, a good way out of this. Like I, I want to be wrong. You know, yeah, I, there, I mean, there's, there's no getting better from this. Yeah. There's no shard cure. Like it, it's like I maybe maybe bone saw or I, I, someone could fix. I don't know. I don't I don't see it. I, mm-hmm. uh, it's so awful. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, I think we're going to have some Ashley talk later on. But yeah. So 
Let's move on into 7.4 for now. Uh, so Victoria is now flying to Ashley's hearing, and it's, you know, the next day, I suppose. Uh, and she's reflecting on how flight itself makes one feel disconnected from humanity because she's literally above it all, and she doesn't have to deal with the daily friction um, of, of just dealing with humanity. I think this is fascinating in context of what you just mentioned uh, uh, in the last chapter about her um, feeling, uh, you know, uh, othering the other humans. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right, um, because that's kind of a natural consequence of this method of travel. Um, I will say that, like, being consciously aware of it, though, is a pretty important step. Like, as long as she's aware that this kind of travel and flying by itself kind of disconnects her from people, then she can keep a, a, a check on it. Because we saw in the last chapter, she was driving with the rest of the Misfit Toys, and she she did that, she says here, intentionally because she wanted to stay connected with them. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't, I could have flown here. I even thought about saying I'm going to fly, but I decided at the end of the day that I needed to ride with them to make sure I stayed connected to them. So, um, as long as she ke keeps being aware that flying around can have that effect on her and tries to put it into check, it doesn't have to be all bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's better that she be aware of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and as she's flying, she's, she's overlooking incidents happening below her that she can't afford to stop and help with, um, which must be really hard for her based on kind of our, our understanding of her character. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's very telling that it triggers a memory in her, Matt, as she's looking at this. She says, once upon a time in a land, a universe away, I told Amy that she couldn't be Scion. I'd have to tell myself much the same in those hectic days after dad's injury and the devastation of my hometown. So this is significant for a couple of reasons. And I think the biggest one is we're now casually referring to Amy and casually thinking back of memories and interactions with Amy with seemingly no emotional or physical reaction at all. Um, we don't we don't get any indication that this kind of puts Victoria out of sorts thinking about this. Um, and that's that's some real progress, Matt. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I love I, that line. I wanted to talk about the scion part of it a bit, because this is something I kind of started thinking about um on my initial read and this idea of scion as like the Superman mm -hmm. or the God. And I think from the perspective of Taylor in the last book, I think we never saw like scion as the universally beloved, like benevolent deity because Taylor just doesn't like you kind of said last chapter, Taylor like doesn't kind of, parse people that way mm -hmm. it's like like very few people are lifted up and very few people are lowered down in her eye her eye mm -hmm. um and so like the the shift from scion changing from this living god to um the the thing that destroyed us all um kind of never was a big concern for her she was always more into okay how do we solve this problem um, but I think it's seeing this, it, it kind of made me realize how crazy of a shift that must have been for people. I mean, that would be like, like if it turns out Jesus is going to kill you all instead of, <laughs> instead of like, it's, it's such a fundamental shift in everyone's understanding and it's something we didn't really get to focus on and worm very much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Taylor was very, uh, if you'll forgive me, utilitarian in, in her thinking about, mm -hmm. you know, about people and. And and also Scion is kind of this like inhuman, e even before you knew he was literally inhuman, he can't he comes off as inhuman because he doesn't speak. He doesn't like right. follow social norms, uh, etc. Um, but, you know, it's it's telling that that both Amy and and Victoria would struggle with this idea of like wanting to be like this, this savior figure because they're both trying so hard to be heroic and to be heroes and and to to be kind of what their mom wants them to be which is this like idealized um aspirational figure right and uh, did she wants him to be scion yeah yeah exactly kind of, pretty much yeah. yeah yeah so old scion we have to differentiate old scion old scion yeah not new scion yeah good scion I, not bad scion. i mean i think that there's probably something deeply literary and profound about the fact that Old Scion and New Scion are the same person. And right. if you want to be Old Scion, you risk being New Scion or something. 
Well, it is. I mean, like that's that's why I love this beat so much because you're reading it, and like in my head, it's just been drilled so much that Scion equals bad now. Mm -hmm. That when you see a sentence like "I told Amy that she couldn't be Scion," and your initial reaction is, "Wait, what? She wants to mass power and then blow people." Oh, you mean like the one that saved all the? Oh, that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that one. Yeah. Right. The guy who would save cats out of trees while dams were bursting on the other side of the world. Okay, so he wasn't perfect, Matt. <laughs> so, he tried his best. So complicated. Yeah, he, well, did he? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Uh, okay, so as she's flying, she sees this huge traffic backup caused by a protest roadblock uh, by students occupying the road. And as a, as a commuter, this, this part of the story made me angrier than anything <laughs> in any other Wild Blow story. Um, that's interesting of course i mean i think anyone else who commutes can empathize with me here people willingly blocking traffic scott sometimes you just got to get noticed matt it's the only way you know if i were these capes i would have just anyway so oh god so there's there's almost a riot at the actual site of the protest where motorists have gotten out of their cars to confront the students and the capes are there keeping a piece in a line between the two groups. Not not very many capes, but but enough for now. Victoria lands and joins them, despite being aware that she can't use the wretch here and she only has one arm. Yeah, and the tension of the scene is so crazy. And the detail to to kind of elevate the tension, I think, is great and worth talking about here. Because we have like the mob is pushing forward. There's this thin line of capes. You're just kind of waiting for things to boil over, and all the writing just keeps reinforcing this. Like she lands and the capes combative already flinched as I dissented. It was hard to breathe here between the lines of thin students, roughly three deep locked elbow to elbow. Um, th this line in a lot of places here in particular, it was only costume and uniform that kept people at bay fear and the threat of the unknown. Just about every Cape present serving as that unknown with powers and capabilities. The crowd couldn't know. Some of the X drivers are close enough for me to touch with my fingertips had I extended my arm further. So all this language, all these words are just reinforcing the, the choked, crowded nature of this whole thing that hard to breathe fear close enough for me to touch with my fingers. All of this is just like it's it's overwhelming and you're just kind of freaking out and waiting for this to go really, really bad. Yeah, I love the sentences where she's talking about how she can like smell and, and feel the heat of the bodies that, that people are yeah. so pressed together it's very like animalistic um this is some great this is also some great descriptive writing um so she uses her aura to get some to get somebody to back down after they grab the strap of her sling and one of the other capes who's present ambrosius chides her for using an emotion power tell, telling her that they're volatile carol then comes to her defense <laughs> the thing that i love about carol coming right at this moment is We've just been in this super hyper tense escalated situation and it finally seems to be like de-escalating a little bit. Like the tension's released. Um, the biggest threat seems to be gone as the, the crowd is starting to disperse. And then bam, it's Carol. It's like out of the frying pan into the crazy mom. And then, of course, we kind of subvert that um, because we think things are going to get like we just go from tense situation to another tense situation. And but what follows is probably one of the more genuine, positive interaction these two have had the whole book. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, it's Carol does seem to be legitimately trying to police herself. And then when she does kind of toe the line or no, that's the wrong expression when she does maybe cross the line. Yeah. Victoria gives her just a little bit of slack, actually. Mm -hmm. She she kind of checks her on it, but she doesn't immediately fly away. So yeah, um, there's this moment where uh, Carol Brandish, she's referred to here, uh, she's been a cape for three times as long as you. She's a good cape. Three times, he asked. Well, not really, she said. She smiled. It's something I tell myself, that she was born a heroine. The powers in the costume came later. Um, so I, I like this cause like, despite, you know, Carol, it's, <laughs> it's heartwarming how obviously proud she is of her daughter. Yeah. Like, look, Carol, Carol, gonna Carol. Yeah. 
<laughs> and like a, a line like that, she can't help but say there's a later line where uh, this guy asks, she's your daughter. And Carol's response is one of them. Yes. Mm-hmm. And you're still just like, Carol, have a fucking filter when you say things in front of your daughter. Like, just use your brain. Um, and, she, and she just she's not good at that. But I think it is telling how much her daughters are at the forefront of her mind at all times. Like, like she's she's happy to see her and she like her response, her automatic response to she's your daughter is to say one of them as if she's like she's trying really hard to make up for the fact that she dismissed one of her daughters for all this time. Um, it, it just it just comes off as Carol's really trying. Yeah. Um, and, and, and as much as she annoys me at times, this this beat where she says, Look, we can talk about the little things that don't matter if you want. I just I just miss my daughter. I just I just want to talk to you. And that got me got me right in the feels box, Matt. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is a good timely reminder that Carol actually loves her. She just kind of has like the coach mom complex, which is yeah. rooted in her own trauma fundamentally. So yeah. like she's also struggling with stuff and that doesn't at all mean that she doesn't love Victoria. It just means that she's really unpleasant to be around for victoria yes she's super shitty at showing it yeah super shitty carol yeah um i like this this i think i think it was actually somebody somebody else pointed out this in particular that made me want to pull it out but i sighed i took in the scene a field of weeds had been turned into mud and uprooted plants by the passage of a few hundred road ragers behind us students were resisting the ones who were willing to who were telling them that it was time to pack up that they'd gotten their message message across and there was no reason to stay you were in costume i noted an updated costume i dabble she said a little while after i started working i saw an article about the refugees and how children were getting lost in transition it struck a chord with me because of what happened to your aunt sarah and me and because i'd lost my own children in a way in transition i shifted my stance giving her a warning look Carol, Carol, gonna Carol. <laughs> she can't help but put that last part in. Yeah. Um, but again, I think this is important. The the updated costume is important. We've we've said for the last three chapters that changes in dress, hair, style are indicative of changes in people. And now to cap this off, we've seen that Carol has updated her costume. She's changed it a little bit. Perhaps Carol has changed a little bit. And that change is spurred on by wanting to act in ways that would help child refugees. Like Victoria is out there trying to make sure what happened to her doesn't happen to anyone else. Mm -hmm. And now Carol has, has taken action to try to help in that same thing for her, the root of her trauma. And it's like, fuck yeah, yeah, Carol. Good job. This also reminds me of one of my favorite things about wild Bow stories is that like the tertiary characters are just having arcs in the background yeah and and just like some character it, it, even even lesser characters than carol will, will be like it'll be like oh they have a you know fenya or menya holding her sister's shield or whatever it's like yeah that's this character who was mentioned twice has an emotional inner life and is doing things that are realistic and, and make you see them as a person um yeah. i love it i love i love what you said about um even when one of them, when when Carol kind of steps over the line, Victoria gives her just a little bit of leeway, though, mm-hmm. because like there's definitely a push and pull here. And you're absolutely right that in the past, Carol steps over that line. Victoria is just like, oh, I'm done. And so it's like things things are not perfect between these two people. And I think they have an, a very long way to go before they are. But but the fact that they are giving each other that leeway, that Carol is realizing when she stepped over the line and trying to modulate that. And Victoria is being just a little more forgiving of those moments yeah. um, is is an improvement of their relationship. And, and Victoria, even when she says, like, this is beginning to feel a bit more like criticism, that's something that like a normal, you know, Right. daughter says to a, a mom that's yeah that's, it, that's not a yeah it's much more conversational than it is um offensive and attacking um the, the, their conversations before this moment was always they were kind of both on the offense and both argue like preemptively arguing with each other and this is much more of like a a normal human being conversation yeah, exactly with still a little bit a little bit of uh 
uh, tension and anger and and um, awkwardness underneath it. Yeah, it's yeah a little bit of give. I, I I love it. I love it. There's this really interesting moment here, Matt, that I wanted to pull out because there's Carol notices her her bullet wound and she said, "You got hurt." And Victoria's response is, uh, power nullifier in the mix. So that was the lie mm-hmm. that Victoria told people when she didn't want them to know like that her indestructible force field was actually not quite so indestructible. Mm-hmm. So why would she repeat that same lie to her mother unless Carol isn't fully aware of how Victoria's power works? I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, the, the the other answer would have to be like I was incautious and got shot, right? Which, I mean, it. I, I guess it, you're you're already admitting to a degree of incautiousness. If, it, I don't know. It, it it's interesting because you might even be like, well, maybe this is like their little secret code game they have where. Right, that just it's they're in public, so they're saying it like yeah, yeah. But the fact that, that was that was the other one. Yeah, but but like also the fact that nobody seems to be around them, eavesdropping obviously suggests that that I, I don't know. I didn't quite. I, I agree that this this stuck out to me as like why would she lie to her mom? And then I was like well, maybe she's not lying or um, it it is it is. I mean, I see I see why she would lie to her mom. The question is, is she lying to her mom? I guess. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Because she doesn't want her mom to see her as weak or, or make mistakes or whatever. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you are right that I hadn't thought of the angle that she's not necessarily admitting that her mom doesn't know how her power works, but she's using that as an excuse that it wasn't my fault. I wasn't being reckless. I wasn't mm-hmm. being too offensive. It's just someone nullified my power. So um, that that definitely could be an explanation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then at this point, Carol makes an actually pretty persuasive argument. Uh, that the misfit toys should, should stay together rather than having to constantly work to stay together. They seem to be pulled together and they're having trouble breaking apart. And she says that's something special. And the conversation ends with mom asking her to prioritize herself. Holy shit, yeah. dude, this is crazy. <laughs> I love Carol here. <laughs> I mean, she's clearly not perfect and she puts her foot in her mouth a few times, but you're right. She's persuasive this group, whatever it is, seems to be helping Victoria. And we've seen that. And Carol sees it too. This line, two, step for- two steps forward and one step back is infinitely better than standing still. Mm-hmm. And man, that's true. And I think th- the difference in this conversation, I think, is that Carol doesn't seem to have an agenda in it. She's not pushing Victoria to something for her own private want or need but merely because she sees that this thing is having a positive impact on her daughter. And she seems to actually understand that and care about it in a way that she just like a a parent, a normal parent way where I just want the best for you. Not I want you to be this thing. It's just, I want what's best for you. This seems to be right now a thing that is best for you. And so I'm encouraging you to do this. And even as I'm encouraging you to do this, take care of yourself as well like don't don't just focus on these people because you're like me as much as you don't want to admit it you're like me and you are the type of person that is going to get caught up in other things and not focus on themselves um so so take care of yourself self-care and it's like what a real like normal mom would do yeah and and she admits quite a bit in this conversation that she's been keeping tabs on victoria so and and i think it's fair to say um, that she's been thinking about her a lot and, and probably progressed in her thinking along the lines of like, yeah. I I may have made some bad assumptions about where Victoria's head is at and what the right approach is to helping her. I'm going to rethink that approach and maybe think more about what's actually good for her rather than what I want for her. Yeah. Perhaps this and, is all overly optimistic, but I like to think that's where that's kind of where she is. You know, it probably is, but I, we could use a little optimism <laughs> in, in post portal explosion world. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, like this, this take care of your team, Victoria. Just take care of yourself too. You deserve it. Work to make sure it carries on being a positive thing, and don't make the mistakes I did. I think that's huge, mm-hmm. and and we know it's huge because 
Victoria says, my mom admitting to mistakes. Mm. Um, it, it's not something we've seen Carol do. And clearly it's not something she has either. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, I don't, I, I think it is important that we, we note that it is not just Carol making progress here, that the reason this conversation went as well as it did is as much to do with Victoria as it is Carol, because you're right. She did say, Hey, I've been keeping tabs on you. And I think an earlier version of this conversation has Victoria flipping out about being kept tabs on by her mother. Mm -hmm. um, something that does not seem to bother her as much this time around that she's maybe a little more understanding of now. Mm -hmm. And so I want to give them both credit for the fact that this did not turn into another shouting match. Yeah, yeah, totally. All right. Well, that wraps up these two wonderful chapters of Arc 7 Torch. Um, let's move on into a little tiny bit of name game. Uh, we've got All right. Ambrosius or Ambrosius, uh, which is apparently a Latin adjective derived from the ancient Greek word Ambrosios, uh, meaning divine or I immortal. Um, so I don't know. We don't know who this guy is, though. So no. can't really draw a lot of connections. And maybe we'll no, see him again. There's a lot of Ambrosiuses um, in history. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of connections we can draw to. So I just wanted to, to set that up. And then if we see him again, we might be able to 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 narrow it down a little bit yeah yeah um, because i mean like w there's a lot of setup in these chapters matt and i think we're setting up a lot of we, we were cutting from this stuff into that eclipse interlude mm -hmm. and i think we're we're setting up characters i mean i think carol's gonna play a pretty big role in this boston stuff yeah um so i th i think we're kind of expertly bringing these characters to the forefront to maybe pay off in a, in a way uh later down the road so yeah i think you're right maybe ambrosius is one of them yeah no it, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me um all right so for as for the discussion question this week um i know you know we we, we pointed out a couple of places actually in these chapters where i think there's some very beautiful and an evocative descriptive writing and you know when i say descriptive writing i mean like the 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 actual text itself is just describing a setting or 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 a visual image and it's not, it's not that there isn't plenty of that throughout the story it, it's just like we've got some particularly concentrated examples of that here um and then i was reflecting on while those use of descriptive writing and and visual imagery um in, throughout his stories and realized that there's there's actually a lot of it it's it's just kind of always subtle enough that it doesn't draw attention to itself and make you think like, wow, what a beautiful poetic description. It's just, it's just like, no, it, it was successful in making me imagine an awesome thing, but the text itself didn't draw attention to itself, which I think is actually highly skillful. So the discussion question after all this rambling is what is your <laughs> favorite example of descriptive writing by Wildbo? Yeah. And let's keep this to worm and ward, please. Because, um, if you, pull out stuff from twig and stuff it's just gonna be like well i can't read that yeah if you're gonna pull out something from twig then also pull out something from worm and ward how about that yeah yeah that's fair and uh that's all we got for you this week on we've got ward you guys are all part of this now so feel free to provide us with advice questions or thoughts on this week's reading you can reach us via email at gotwormpod at gmail.com or on twitter at gotwormpod my personal twitter is at scottdaily85 and Matt's is at Morden Clips. If you're not already subscribed to We've Got Ward, we strongly recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else in the world that you can listen to podcasts. And as always, you can find all the other podcasts we do and all of our writing essays and film and TV criticism and more at Daily Planet Films. Dot com. This week, the Daily Planet podcast reviewed Solo, a Star Wars story. Matt and I got on to talk about that movie, which I did not like very much. And Matt did, but I tricked him into thinking my way. Yeah, I had a, I really enjoyed that movie until we talked about it. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's right. And uh, if you like any of these shows and you want to support them, consider donating to our Patreon account patreon.com slash daily planet films you can donate a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford 
Supporting us on Patreon gives you tons of great bonuses like voting in our quarterly fan art contests, Q&A sessions, access to live streams of our recording sessions, and our excellent Discord chat. Special thanks to new contributors Planeteer, Bluebla at the $1 level, and Brett at the $1 level. And uh, Dark Glass, who upgraded to $50 a month and is now literally Superman. Wow. Yeah, thanks, Dark Glass. Literally, thanks, everyone. Yes, but literally Superman. Superman. That's amazing. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. And, and as always, make sure you go over to Wildbo's Patreon, patreon.com slash Wildbo, and donate to him as well. It is his world that we're playing in. You changed it up. It totally threw me off. <laughs> Um, if you cannot afford to donate right now, that's absolutely okay. You can instead help us out by heading on over to Apple Podcasts and leaving us a rating and a review. This week's review comes from Liam Oster, who gives us five stars and says, I love this. I read the first few arcs before I discovered the podcast, but now I don't know how I would live without it. I look forward to it daily. Keep up the great work. You guys are the best. No, you're the best, Liam. And thank you for the sweet daily pun. Yeah, that was great. He spelled it with my last name. Yeah. That's the didn't really work in audio <laughs> format. I also did um, quotes, but then I can't can't see that. Yeah, I also kind of like winked at the camera, which also yeah. didn't work in the audio format. Yeah. So we kind of fucked that up. All right, <laughs> uh, that's it for the show this week. Next week we head to Boston to cover the bonus eclipse arc. Oh, I was going to do a Boston accent, and then I forgot what the Boston accent was. Boston, I, I don't, I don't really know either. Shit. Well, just pretend like I talked Boston. Okay. Bye.